But I'd like to illustrate some of this by a great Catholic work, but a great popular work of 20th century literature, uh, J.R. Tolkien's famous novel, The Lord of the Rings. More available to many people now is the movies from Peter Jackson. Uh, they're good movies, but they're not as good as the book. So if you've seen the movie and you haven't read the book, you should read the book too. And there are some interesting differences. I won't try to go into that now. Uh, P Peter Jackson, though, to a large extent, removes the political side of the novel to focus on the personal friendship side of things in the novel. So the novel has a much more complex view of the interaction between the personal and the public than the movies do. The movie turns the relationship between Sam and Frodo, for example, pretty much into the typical buddy movie stories that we see in movies. Two friends, rather different in personality, but really they're great friends together. That's all true of the novel as well, but in Tolkien there's a more complex view of the relationship between the personal and the public. So let me talk a little bit about that in uh, concluding my remarks. <clears throat> so in The Lord of the Rings, Sam is from the, the servant class among the hobbits. And Frodo is from the hobbit aristocracy, although the hobbit society is a fairly flat, not a very hierarchical society. Still, there are some differences there. So Sam and Sam's family has long been a, uh, they've long been the gardeners for the family that Frodo comes from. Sam is charged to go with Frodo on the quest to destroy the great ring of power that can bring nothing but evil. And so Sam has been the loyal servant to Frodo all the way through to the dark world of Mordor. But there comes a moment when Frodo is stung by a giant spider and paralyzed. And Sam is left in a terrible dilemma. As uh, Tolkien puts it, he debates with himself, what should I do? It appears that Frodo is dead and can no longer carry out the quest. Should I, Sam, the servant of Frodo, now step forward? And so here's the way that Tolkien puts this. Time went by, and still Sam knelt holding Frodo's hand, and in his heart keeping a debate. What am I to do then? Sam cried. And now he seemed plainly to know the hard answer. The hard answer was, see the quest through. But Sam says in his own mind, what, me, alone? Go to the crack of doom and all? The crack of doom is where you throw the ring in to destroy it. Sam quailed, but his resolve grew. That is, he, he, he drew himself back, but yet his resolve grew. He thought, this is what I must do. But then the debate goes on in his head, and Sam says, it's not for me to go taking the ring, putting myself forward. Who am I to do this? This was for Frodo, a great man. I'm a little man. Right? You, you go look at the Basilica of St. Peter's, you say, but St. Peter, he's too great a man. I'm not called to be an apostle. And then they dig underground and they find the bones of this humble man who died. And the basilica was built on his bones, a peasant's bones. It's not for me to go putting myself forward. Who am I to be an apostle? All those aristocratic fishermen, they could be apostles, not me. But then Sam thinks, but you haven't put yourself forward. You've been put forward. You might say you've been called. And as for not being the right and proper person, well, Mr. Frodo wasn't, you might say, nor Mr. Bilbo. They were just hobbits too. They didn't choose themselves. 
So what should I do? Sit here and let the orcs come and kill me and take the ring? Or do I take it and go? And he says, I'm going to take it then. Now, at this point, you might say, Sam has decided that his universal mission, the, a political mission, has taken precedence over his personal friendship with Frodo. There's a tension between what Sam feels as the duties of friendship to Frodo and what he feels as his more universal duties to help the quest to destroy the Ring of Power. And at this point, Tolkien has shown us, you might say, Sam in a Plato mood. Sam becoming a Platonist and saying, now I'm going to identify with the universal cause, not with this personal cause of personal friendship. But it turns out Sam can't stick to his Platonism. He falls back into Aristotelianism. Sam says to himself a little later in the novel, I've made up my mind. And like most men who say, I've made up my mind, that means he hasn't made up his mind at all. He says to himself, have I got it wrong? What ought I to have done? But it's only in the moment when he sees the awful orcs, the great enemies, come and find Frodo's body and start to carry it away. It's only at that point that Sam knows his true heart. And Sam, at that point, Tolkien writes, flung the quest and all his decisions away. I've made up my mind. No, you haven't made up your mind. You made up your mind when you did something, not when you said something. Fear and doubt go away when he makes the real decision. And he knows now where his place is and had been at Frodo's side. And so Sam says, my place is by Mr. Frodo. Everybody has to understand that. Elrond and the council, the elves, the lords, the ladies, with all their wisdom, their plans have gone wrong. I can't be their ring bearer. I can't take on their universal mission. I'm devoted to my personal mission, to Mr. Frodo. And Sam then says, you fool, to himself. That's worth saying to yourself every day or so. You fool, Frodo wasn't dead, and your heart knew it. Don't trust your head, Sam. It's not the best part of you. The trouble with you is you never really had any hope. Now what is to be done? I'm not sure Tolkien knew that that was Lenin's political question, what is to be done. You never really had any hope. For when Sam decided, I have to take up a universal mission and abandon my private mission, that was an expression of a lack of hope for Sam. When Sam's hope returns, he realizes, my, what I'm called to do isn't to save the whole world. I am called to do something much more specific, to love Frodo. My love for Frodo may end up redeeming the world, or redeeming part of the world. And probably much more effectively than if I decided after reading Plato's Republic, luckily Sam didn't read that much, so he hadn't read it. If I had decided after reading Plato's Republic, there are no personal duties. There are only universal duties. But what turns out to be true for Sam is that the way he lives out his universal duties is exactly by being committed to his personal duties. Now, most people, when they finish reading this chapter in The Lord of the Rings, Sam is their hero. Right? Sam, the man who sticks by his dying friend, that personal loyalty, and the fact that Sam has given up the mission to destroy the ring of power and the ring of evil in order to be true to his personal friendship is something that the reader embraces. Tolkien has written the story so that we're on, on Sam's side 
on this question. That's what Peter Jackson does. He makes it into a buddy movie, and Sam is the best buddy anybody ever had. But Tolkien doesn't leave the story there. The next chapter, Tolkien's a very sly writer, the very next chapter gives us the same tension between friendship and citizenship, between a more personal call and a more universal call, but now puts us on the side of the universal. This is the confrontation between Gandalf, everybody's favorite wizard, who's not on Gandalf's side, right? Who reads the Lord of the Rings and thinks, that Gandalf is a slippery character. The confrontation between Gandalf and Denethor, the steward of Gondor, the man who is now the political ruler of Gondor. Denethor doesn't trust Gandalf. Now, some of that is a matter of simply personal pride. There's no doubt that Tolkien presents Denethor as a ruler who wants to be in charge. And so, sometimes he forgets his very duties because he's pointing at himself. That's how Tolkien makes you take Gandalf's side. But Tolkien does something very complicated, but he fools you. You like Gandalf, you don't like Denethor, so you don't listen to what Denethor says. I've noticed people do that now and again. You may have seen that in your own life. You listen to people you like. You don't listen to people you don't like. Well, who you like doesn't happen to track what's true. Denethor has part of the truth. Here's the confrontation. Denethor, his job is not to save the world. His job is to save Gondor. He's the steward of Gondor. He's not the steward of the world. Now, of course, there would be immoral ways to devote yourself simply to one political community. But there would also be immoral ways to abandon your commitment to one political community just to think you'd save the world. And Tolkien is quite aware of that. So here's what happens when Denethor confronts Gandalf. Denethor is irritated because Gandalf doles out information in a way that suits Gandalf's purposes, not in a way that suits Denethor's purposes. And Denethor says to Gandalf, the Lord of Gondor, notice he doesn't call himself the steward of Gondor because of course his pride gets in the way. The Lord of Gondor is not to be made the tool of other men's purposes however worthy, even if they're saving the world, my job is to save Gondor and its people. You know, when I decided which children to send to college, did I survey all the children in my town and think, who's most worthy for me to pay college tuition for? No! I pay college tuition for my daughters. My job is my daughter's. And if you bring me your poor daughter or poor son and say, well, this one's more worthy than your daughter. Send her to college. I just close the door and walk away. I'm the steward of, I'm the Lord, maybe. <laughs> The Lord of Gondor is not to be made the tool of other men's purposes, however worthy. That's not my job. That's not my work. To him, he goes on, Denethor says, to the Lord of Gondor, there's no purpose higher in the world as it now stands than the good of Gondor. And the rule of Gondor is mine and no other man's. Now, Clearly, that's put in a way that makes us feel like Denethor is a man who's willful and prideful. But yet, we have to admit there's some truth 
about what his calling is, what his commitment is. And then Gandalf is given some beautiful words, but yet words that can't be the whole story, even if they're a crucial part of the story. Here's how Gandalf replies to Denethor's assertion that I have to watch out for the good of my political community, the one I'm charged with, not a universal good of the whole world. Gandalf says this, in that task, that is the task of saving Gondor, you shall have all the aid that you're pleased to ask for. I'll do anything I can to help you be the lord and steward of Gondor. But I will say this, says Gandalf, the rule of no realm is mine, neither of Gondor nor any other, great or small. I don't have that special commitment to that particular place. He says, all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care, all worthy things. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail of my task, though Gondor should perish. If anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in days to come. For, Gandalf completes his oration, I also am a steward. Did you not know? We're all called to be universal stewards of the world, but we're called to be universal stewards through being particular stewards for most of us. No doubt there are some of us, not many, who will be called to be Gandalf. None of us will be called to be just like Denethor because of his willfulness and his pridefulness. But we may be called to be like Sam so that our friendships, our personal friendships, are the way we participate in citizenship, rather than to throw away a private life in order for a radically public life, like the one that Plato envisioned, to become ours. Solidarity and subsidiarity, they're both necessary for us. Be careful, as Tolkien was careful, to show us if we read him with enough care. Be careful to think that the thing you like is the thing that captures the whole truth. The truth is more complicated, and so the respect that we have for people who live out different vocations, different lives, some more personal, some more public, some more universal, some more particular, that respect should go deep, should go as deep as the argument between Plato and Aristotle. Those of you who feel that your control of wisdom is greater than the control of Plato or of Aristotle, I nominate you to become steward not of Gondor or of Rome, but of the whole world. And I'll be glad to meet you at the end of this session. For the rest of us, I suspect the lesson, lessons of humility of listening to Plato and Aristotle's debate inform such a deeply modern, and I might add deeply Catholic work, as Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, should be lesson enough, a lesson in intellectual humility, as well as a lesson in life's complexities. Thank you very much.